like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore Young Lulin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar. Thank you for joining us. Be prepared to hear a great talk by Associate Professor Johannes Grillari, who is our guest today. I would like you, as always, um, to use the Q&A function to send your questions, which are highly um, valued, and of course, your comments. And as always, uh, in our webinar, we start it with a presentation. And today, uh, Camille Pavis, a postgraduate student from our Center for Health and Longevity, is presenting a quite interesting paper about body temperature and its relation with lifespan. Camille, over to you. Thank you for the introduction. Today, I will present a simple yet elegant paper by Jawed Al, highlighting that increased body temperature shortens lifespan in rodents. Over 100 years ago, it was noted that lung species have a lower metabolic rate. Put another way, metabolic rate has a negative correlation with lifespan. This became known as the rate of living theory. It is intuitively true to many of us, I assume, and the concept has inspired artists and directors alike. This theory, however, quickly started to falter and fall apart. For example, metabolic rate is high in birds, which are very long lived compared to equally heavy mammals. It turns out that body weight is indeed the driving force behind species longevity. When you plot the metabolic rate residue against the lifespan residue that is both made independent of body weight, you can see that the correlation vanishes. It has become accepted that the rate of living theory is probably wrong without much experimental evidence to support this because it is difficult to test. Metabolic rate and body temperature are correlated which is a problem. The issue here is that metabolic rate and body temperature are often both decreased in long-lived models, and it might be the latter which is beneficial. The authors set out to test this experimentally. They took hamsters and mice from the Swiss strain, splitting them into three groups, those that were kept at normal ambient temperature, group two, those kept at elevated ambient temperature, and finally group three was kept at elevated temperature but allowed to regulate and decrease body temperature through convection. That means a fan was installed above the cage. It is known that animals kept at the upper end of the so-called thermoneutral zone, as in group two and three, will decrease their metabolic rate in order to reduce heat production. Therefore, the rate of living theory would predict that animals in group two and group three should be equally long lived. To the contrary, it was found that animals kept at higher temperature were shorter lived. At the top, you can see data for hamsters of both genders and at the bottom for mice. In gray is the lifespan of control animals. You can see that in all cases, the red trace for the group subjected to elevated ambient temperature shifts to a shorter lifespan. In every case, lifespan is almost normalized by adding the electric fan, which is shown in blue. This provides experimental evidence against the rate of living theory. Since rodents are very susceptible to infections, the authors also looked at inflammation because high temperature may promote bacterial growth. To the right, you can see that cytokines were not changed with varying temperatures 
arguing against the role of inflammation or infection in the lifespan effects observed here. Next, the authors looked at body weight, showing that hamsters in all groups have the same body weight as controls, shown here at the top, and the same was also true for mice, shown at the bottom. This argues against involuntary caloric restriction as an explanation for the lifespan differences. Interestingly, the animals housed under increased ambient temperature had a lower food intake. How do they not lose weight? As explained in the beginning, and as we will see in the next slide, they have reduced energy expenditure. As you can see here, all hamsters housed at higher ambient temperature had significantly decreased daily energy expenditure measured as their oxygen consumption. This was true both at night and during the day. At the bottom, you can see the same was true for mice. Finally, to the right is shown body temperature measured by an implanted sensor. You can see that the group housed at higher ambient temperature had a higher body temperature shown by the red trace. In contrast, the gray control trace and the blue trace overlap for most of the time and most of the animals, suggesting that the electric fan indeed helped to normalize body temperature. We can also see other adaptations in these animals. There was atrophy of the small intestine in groups which were exposed to higher ambient temperature, and also atrophy of brown fat deposits, which are normally used to generate heat and were expandable at higher temperatures. The data the authors provide in the supplementary tables is replotted here to the right to make this a bit clearer. In summary, the authors make the case that it is body temperature and not metabolic rate that determines lifespan. The study is strong because it included two species and both males and females. However, there are also some problems. We do not know why these mice die, and body temperature and metabolic rate were only measured in young mice. Also, it is not clear to me why the authors used an unusually short-lived mouse strain in the study. Finally, the work is at, at odds with another recent experimental study that found that normalizing body temperature in growth hormone dwarfs failed to affect lifespan. Nevertheless, it is an interesting study and I agree with the authors. Perhaps we can screen for drugs that reduce body temperature in order to pre-select compounds that could improve health span and lifespan. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Camille. Nice uh, presentation. Uh, it might say that we shouldn't live in the heat. We are actually exposed in, uh, in Singapore. And it might also be uh, good to see if the hamsters and the mice actually, if they had the same physical activity, I don't think that they corrected for that. But uh, that's another discussion. Um, I would like to introduce you to Associate Professor Johannes Grillari. Um, he is the director of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Traumatology in Vienna. And of course, that's in Austria. And he is also the associate professor at the Department of Biotechnology in Vienna. He studies uh, the molecular and physiological uh, changes of cellular aging. And he really pioneered the role of microRNAs, RNA biology and extracellular vesicles in cellular senescence and also in bone and skin regeneration. And he is uh, currently quite interested in how to use these extracellular vesicles in their cargo. What that is, I think we will learn in uh, tissue generation. So he published lots of articles, more than 190, and then highly cited publications. And he also holds, and that's a huge number, 14 patents and has co-founded four spin-off uh, companies. I know um, Professor Grillari uh, well from my uh, time in the Netherlands and he was a lovely uh, collaborator always in the study. So I'm very, very happy to have him on board here and hear his newest results of his uh, studies and his thoughts about aging. Um, Johannes, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Uh... Very, very nice uh, introduction and uh, same on my side, always a pleasure to collaborate and, and discuss with you, Andrea. And many thanks for inviting me to this uh, to this seminar series and actually also a very nice surprise to see Camille, uh, who, who also worked in Vienna for some time. Uh, and uh, to, to, to meet you again, Camille, hi. 
Uh, so yeah, uh, as Andrea mentioned, I'm uh, uh, as a disclaimer, I'm a co-founder of four companies. I'm scientific advisor there, but I'm obviously not operatively active. Uh, and all all these companies, they somehow were spun out uh, of uh, my wife's lab and mine, or uh, more of mine and a little bit of my wife's lab. And actually, uh, uh, my, my wife left uh, academia a couple of years ago to run one of the companies now by herself, uh, Eversight. Um, yeah, my, 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 my topic is the, the journey I made uh, over the past uh, five, six years uh, from cellular senescence to tissue regeneration uh, in an institute that is uh, mainly focused on regenerating uh, uh, tissue that was damaged due to uh, workers' accidents mainly. Uh, but obviously, since also uh, workers get uh, uh, older, uh, there is a huge unmet clinical need uh, to address also uh, in, in that patient group uh, regenerative capacities after, after accidents and after trauma. Uh, so I don't think I need to tell you why we should study biological aging, uh, but, but I, I think it's clear. Uh, this is the substrate on which... Uh, degenerative age-associated diseases then are growing. Uh, and uh, we are at a critical time uh, point in, in, in history. Uh, is the first, uh, 2019 was the first time uh, that uh, the, the ones living, the, 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 the children below the age of five, uh, five years uh, were less uh, than uh, the elderly popula population aged 65 and, and more. So I think this is a very drastic example of how the uh, population uh, age is uh, changing. And we see this comes with a huge and tremendous uh, cost in the uh, health economic uh, system, uh, but ob obviously also uh, with the challenge uh, and the burden of, of how to take care of, uh, of all the elderly. Uh, my lab has been focused on, on cellular senescence as a potential driver of biological aging for a, for a long time. And uh, so we, we think that uh, the amount of senescent cells, uh, exam for example, induced by, uh, uh, in, in the body of Keith Richards here, um, th this image was taken at uh, his age of 65, uh, maybe uh, induced by stressors, uh, uh, in, in, in his body uh, is in sharp contrast to the image here of uh, Tina Turner at 68. I'm pretty sure that uh, some of her senescence cells were uh, maybe surgically uh, re removed uh, by extrinsic factors here. So uh, if this uh, is true, if senescence cells really uh, would uh, at least contribute to the aging process, then uh, what is the model there? And this goes back to Lenny Hayflick uh, to the uh, 1960s, uh, where uh, Hayflick isolated um, human fibroblasts from the skin, put them into culture, and cultivated them serially passage. So the cells are growing, they are dividing, and at a specific time point, they enter a state of irreversible growth arrest, which is called replicative senescence. And Hayflick uh, uh, in the 60s postulated that this could be a model of uh, the aging process also for humans. And you can imagine, this is very in vitro. The, the, the model seems very artificial. Uh, by now we know that uh, this senescent state of cells can also occur earlier before all the cells have replicated and replicated, uh, induced by uh, stressors like uh, uh, chemotherapeutics or DNA damaging agents of reactive oxygen species, uh, sunlight. And well, from this artificial model in the 60s to really convincing people that this might also be something that happens uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in vivo in humans and how this then might uh, affect really the, the aging process. It took some while and uh, and now we, we believe uh, that uh, something like this model is true. Whatever the cause of inducing cellular senescence might be, the senescent cells that chronically can um, accumulate in tissues uh, lose their uh, tissue-specific physiologic function. Uh, they sometimes get removed by the immune system, causing the surrounding tissue to replicate and starting a vicious so uh, cycle to that, that then ends up in, in uh, 
using up the replicative potential again. Uh, and, and this, I, we think now, is one of the most uh, detrimental culprits of the aging process, the, uh, the signaling function of senescent cells. They start to secrete uh, pro-inflammatory factors, extracellular matrix uh, uh, remodeling factors uh, that change the tissue and change the tissue homeoste homeostasis, which at the end leads to what we see in the elderly, decline of organ and tissue function, decline of stem cell functionality, and with, the, with this aging and age-associated diseases. Uh, in the 2010s, we started to find senescent cells in the human body. Uh, and actually, by now, uh, we, we know that at any site of, um, of age-associated diseases, we can find senescent cells also accumulating in the human body. Uh, be it neurodegenerative diseases, be it uh, uh, muscle degeneration and sarcopenia, be it osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and obviously also uh, cardiac uh, aging, we always find uh, senescent cells in, in these tissues. So that gave the question, what happens if we would be able to specifically eliminate senescent cells of, of, of the body? And uh, these models were uh, addressed uh, in, uh, at Mayo Clinic and at Buck Institute. Uh, and what by now we know is that almost any major age-associated disease, like, like those listed here, atherosclerosis, tachexia, cataracts, cardiac aging, diabetes, uh, lung aging, uh, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, sarcopenia. Uh, if you eliminate senescent cells in mouse models, you can also alleviate uh, the age-associated condition. Uh, and an image tells you more than a thousand words. This is two mice, uh, same age. Uh, one, if the one in front is uh, has been treated uh, with this with this novel class of drugs, which we call senolytics for senescence lysing agents, so killing off senescent cells, while the one in the back was not treated. Same age, and I think uh, it's very clear that uh, the, the senolytic drug that was, uh, um, that was um, developed in uh, Peter de Kaiser's lab, uh, he's now in Utrecht, uh, uh, how efficient this is in uh, al already visually uh, uh, change the, the, the pace of the aging process. So my lab started very early on, on trying to understand uh, what is it that makes us an essence cells and for a cell. And for that, we, we, we looked at uh, which genes are expressed in, in senescent cells and which are differentially expressed uh, in, in senescent versus non-senescent cells. And we did that uh, by any method that was available at the at the time. So uh, going back to the, the methods, then you know how, how old I am by now. Uh, I was actually working uh, even uh, before microarrays came up uh, on, on, on this topic. And we look at the DNA uh, as the storage of information that uh, is transcribed into RNA. And RNA is then uh, as a messenger molecule translated into protein, into function. We, we always think protein is the functional part. MicroRNAs in this process, uh, they block messenger RNA translation, and by that they exert a, a, a genetic control uh, to, to control for the function that the cell should then have. So microRNAs are inhibitors of, of gene expression. So going back to all the, the, the old data we, we collected, by now we know that genes that are differentially expressed in senescence, they actually do impact on the lifespan of organisms. So there is a connection between cellular senescence and the lifespan of uh, individuals. This is one factor, actually a DNA repair and splicing factor. If we uh, knock it, uh, sorry, if we overexpress it in fruit flies, fruit flies live healthier and uh, more active and actually also longer. Uh, this is, a, this is a, an RNA methyl transferase, enzyme 5. If we knock it out, worms live longer, uh, flies live longer, and even uh, uh, single cell organisms uh, like uh, yeast are living longer and are more functionally and more stress resistant. So there is this connection that was uh, uh, some early work that we did. So coming now to the 
altered signaling function in, in senescence, the so-called SASP, the senescence associated secretory phenotype. Um, so by now we know that uh, the systemic environment, meaning the whole tissue and the, the, bl the blood that is in the circulation uh, in, uh, in at least animal models, um, generates a, a, a not favorable environment for regeneration and thus we think it increases the aging process. We, we, we know that by coupling the blood circulation of a young and an old mouse, uh, the old mouse starts to gain functionality in the context of uh, all the organs tested so far, brain, bone, uh, 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 heart, uh, liver, muscle, and, and, and colon. So there must be something secreted uh, into the systemic environment, into the blood, that either uh, is missing in the old mice, uh, which would maintain functionality, or it is something that is actively secreted by old organisms to inhibit functionality. So one of the potential culprits is what senescent cells secrete. And uh, what is now this SASP? It is composed of, uh, of proteins, uh, cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, it is uh, composed of lipids and uh, only very recently discovered uh, extracellular vesicles and their cargo. So what, whatever they transport inside or on their surface. Um, so, so what are extracellular vesicles? Uh, by now we define three types uh, according to the biogenesis, how they are produced. Uh, if they are coming from multivesicular bodies, uh, which fuse with the cell plasma membrane, we call them exosomes. If they are budding from the plasma membrane, we call them microvesicles. And if they come from dying cells, uh, they, we call them apoptotic bodies. And these vesicles, they can be taken up by surrounding cells, by any mechanism that we know uh, about uh, how uh, particles from the environment can be taken up by uh, endocytosis, by fusion, by, and by phagocytosis and variants thereof. Size is a marker because the, uh, the membranes are very similar of all three different vesicle types. So exosomes are the smallest, 30 to 100 nanometers in diameter. Then we have the, uh, the microvesicles or ectosomes that are budding from the membrane, apoptotic bodies, and then well, cells are, as a comparison, 8 to 12 micrometers uh, in, in size. So they are uh, uh, pr pretty small things. And we think about uh, these extracellular vesicles uh, like uh, about a message in a bottle. So the lipid, the, uh, the lipid envelope that we have is like this glass here of the, of, the, of the bottle. And then inside the cargo, what is transferred is for example, a letter telling a, a recipient cell what it should do. Uh, almost like a hormone, we, we, could, we could compare that uh, to a hormonal action. Uh, so what is this message? And by now we know that uh, extracellular vesicles can influence growth, proliferation, inflammation, immune response, invasivity of cancer cells, uh, uh, and so on and so on. And the language of this message is the language of the biomolecules. Uh, it's nucleic acids like RNA, uh, and there my lab is especially interested in microRNAs, as I, as I said before, but also of lipids, and also of obviously proteins here. Uh, so we also know that these vesicles, they can exert either positive functions, so James Bond-like functions, or they can exert uh, the bad functions. So this is one of the famous uh, adversaries of, 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 of James Bond, uh, actually an Austrian actor, uh, Christopher Waltz. Uh, so he, so, this, 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 this actually this bad activity uh, when when the extracellular vesicles come from uh, deceased cells or senescent cells during aging, then we think that they have a detrimental effect on the surrounding. In in uh, in, in, in accordance with our ideas about this senescence associated secretory phenotype. Uh, 
So our experiments went back to uh, the first parabiosis model by Tom Randall, where he connected the young and the old uh, uh, mouse uh, with the circulation and observed that the muscle stem cell functionality get, got better in the old mouse. So we didn't have mice in the lab, we had cells. So we used the endothelial cells, the cells lining uh, the blood vessels for where we think that uh, factors could likely come from. Uh, and tested if they would have an effect, these, these secreted things from, from endothelial cells, on mesenchymal stem cells. We didn't have muscle stem cells in the, in the lab, but mesenchymal stem cells. And these mesenchymal stem cells, they can form the bone. So we tested for proliferation uh, 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 after exposing uh, these mesenchymal stem cells to the secreted extracellular vesicles from senescent cells, and actually the cells grow faster, uh, but they do not differentiate to bone anymore. And to cut the long story short, what we, what we found is that senescent endothelial cells secrete exosomes, uh, which transfer microRNA, specifically microRNA31, which is inhibiting a plethora of factors that drive osteogenesis, which drive the bone formation process. And by this inhibition, we think that uh, in the organism, uh, we get a disbalance between bone formation uh, and bone resorption. Uh, so uh, more, uh, less osteoblasts would, uh, that would build the bone and less osteoclasts that eat away, uh, and, and more osteoclasts that eat away on the, on the bone. And we think that this contributes to osteoporosis and slow bone healing as we observe in, in elderly. So if... Uh, if this is true that microRNAs uh, uh, play a functional role, then the question is, can we use them to improve diagnostics for osteoporosis as one of the major silent epidemics uh, uh, in uh, the elderly population? So the good news is we, we, we have pretty good medication uh, 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 to reduce the risk uh, to suffer from osteoporotic fractures. However, the bad news is we do not really have a good diagnostic and prognostic tool uh, to identify who should be treated. So look at this here. Uh, this is uh, 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 individuals that did not suffer from a fracture. Uh, this is individuals that suffered from a fracture. And you see all these individual in between the red lines here, they have the same T-score, uh, which comes from a, a bone densitometry, uh, considered the golden standard of uh, osteoporosis uh, uh, prediction. Actually, the predictivity of, 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 this, uh, of this measure or of the FRAX questionnaire uh, over the populations in the world is about 0 0.65. 0 0.5, a value of 0 0.5 would be complete randomness. Uh, a value of one would be a perfect classification. So 0 0.65 is, uh, you, can, you can imagine, is not a very uh, efficient predictor. So can we do better with measuring microRNAs now from the systemic environment, from the blood? So do we have a blood or can we develop a blood-based marker uh, for predicting osteoporosis? Uh, microRNAs, uh, they come uh, specifically from different tissues, which gives us the opportunity to take a snapshot uh, of the composition of the body and of the status of different Tissues. We actually also use that for assessing uh, toxicology uh, of assessing toxicity of uh, of drugs, for example. By now, uh, we set out to, to to test this in the context of osteoporosis uh, in preclinical models. Here, this is a postmenopausal rat model, uh, which develops a very rapid uh, osteoporotic phenotype, and we see that microRNAs definitely actually. Uh, react within the bone tissue, but also in the serum. And that correlates pretty well. Uh, if we look now from a preclinical model to a, to a population-based uh, study, uh, we see that uh, using microRNAs like 203, we can identify a population at high risk of fracturing. Actually, after three years of follow-up, so the blood was taken here at the, at the time point of at baseline. Uh, and a combination of the FRAX questionnaire and, uh, and this microRNA identifies a population of, of individuals that after three years uh, to 50% have fractured. 
So these really need treatment, uh, we are pretty sure. And uh, we are now, this is one of the companies uh, that we founded. We are now trying to get this uh, to the patients as a CEIVD marked diagnostic test. Uh, but now we have uh, uh, used that test in a couple of different uh, populations in San Francisco, in, in Vienna, in uh, Iceland. And uh, the AUC value, you remember the one that is 0.65 for, uh, uh, for, for FRAX or, or, or uh, the bone densitometry, uh, the microRNA based AUC uh, value of a limited amount of patients, but still uh, very different patients. Uh, is 0 0.85 already. So we think that we are going to be way better than what, uh, what uh, is currently on the market. Um, due to time reasons, I, I, I jump over the cross stockings that we uh, observed in skin. Uh, in, the, in the essence, it's very similar. Senescent fibroblasts uh, detrimentally uh, impact um, the, the functionality of um, of, of keratinocytes, and with this, the barrier formation of the skin. Uh, we can see uh, extracellular vesicles in the skin by electron microscopy. Uh, I love this image because uh, uh, seeing is believing. Uh, we have these extracellular vesicles really in the histology of, uh, of humans. Uh, we can also isolate vesicles from humans by open flow microperfusion. Uh, and we see, actually, this is considered minimally invasive, this technology here. Uh, which to me is, uh, looks funny, uh, minimally invasive. Hmm. Uh, but still, we can isolate the vesicles. We find microRNAs in these vesicles. Uh, and we can show that these microRNAs are also really transported from fibroblasts in skin models in vitro, uh, from fibroblasts to uh, keratinocytes. And by this, uh, also contribute to differentiation versus proliferation. Same or similar to what we saw for the, for the bone uh, uh, environment. Uh, so the, the summary one is that extracellular vesicles and the microRNA cargo, they are part of the SASP and uh, they are potential biomarkers for age associated diseases as well as for senescence. And actually we solved, I think, the most important question, which is why do vampires uh, bite young girls? And the answer is clear. Uh, they need to dilute their SASP because which vampire would want to have weak bones and uh, uh, non-functional skin for the rest of eternity? And, and you see he looks, uh, Christopher Lee looks really uh, pretty young still here in this movie. Um, so can we counteract the negative effects of senescent cells in skin? And for this, we collaborated with uh, Chanel in, in Paris we established uh, skin equivalence in vitro, human skin equivalence. So here uh, you have uh, the dermis, we, you have the uh, epidermis here. And we increase the amounts of senescent cells in the uh, dermis and tested if that would have an effect on the uh, differentiation of keratinocytes here. And actually it does, the, 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 the skin equivalence uh, lose functionality, the keratinocytes do not form a nice barrier anymore. The more senescent cells we add, the worse it gets, but we can counteract. And actually we can counteract with a, a plant extract from a, a golden rod, a Latin name Solidago Vigarea Alpestris, code name at Chanel was 1201. Uh, this was uh, a winning extract of a, of a batch of about uh, 20 different uh, plant extracts. And we saw right away that senescence beta gal associated staining, which is one of the markers of cellular senescence in vitro, uh, that this went down uh, after treatment with this extract. Uh, actually, we then were able to see that uh, the whole inflammatory phenotype, this SASP, this inflammatory SASP of the cells is reduced after using uh, this plant extract. Uh, so we see less uh, less recruiting of the immune system in, in, in vitro assays. Uh, and finally, when we pre-treat senescent cells with this extract and then put it into our uh, skin equivalence uh, in vitro, we see that the disturbing uh, of the barrier formation by the keratinocytes is restored by this extract in, in vitro. 
So we were happy, we published, uh, Chanel was happy and started to formulate this uh, extract into their products. And this is an image courtesy of their, uh, uh, of their studies with uh, human female probands. And what they uh, observe is that very similar to our in vitro skin equivalents, uh, also in the patients after uh, three months of use of this, uh, of this cream containing this uh, golden rod extract, uh, the epidermal thickness is restored and skin looks better. Now, it's nice to suppress negative effects of senescent cells, but wouldn't it be better to clear them off? So we tested if this extract would act as a senolytic. You remember this drug that uh, improves the, the mouse in the, in the image before. And uh, actually it had some weed, some very weak effect so we, we did clear some senescent cells, but uh, only after 39 days and uh, only very inefficiently. So the question was, can we do better? Do we find a different pathway, a novel one? And I, I, I wouldn't tell you these slides if uh, we uh, would not have been successful. And we were successful by looking at lipids, at, 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 the, at the fat content uh, of uh, senescent cells, comparing them to, uh, uh, to young cells. And uh, here from uh, a mass spectrometry uh, approach where we identified different, actually a whole range of different uh, lipids, two stood out as upregulated in senescent cells. Replicative senescence, stress-induced premature senescence using reactive oxygen species, using chemotherapeutic drugs, they always come up very robustly, very, very cleanly, very clearly. That's, that's the chemical form, formula of this. Uh, of these two lipids, uh, we call them lyso SPC and lyso PPC, abbreviated together to lyso PCs, uh, and they they go nicely up. Uh, this is the quantification of the data before, uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, if we use telomerase immortalized fibroblasts as a long-term cultivation control, it's not induced in this sense. So meaning that what we see here is a real response to senescence and not to growth arrest and not to long-term cultivation in, in, uh, in vitro and so on. So the question is, do we, see, do we see these molecules also coming up in elderly in vivo or ex vivo? So we used uh, a fantastic methodology by, uh, in collaboration with Martina marchetti deschmann at the Technical University here in Vienna. Uh, she has a tissue mass spec. So pixel per pixel, she, she, she can use for shotgun proteomics and identify all the lipids that are in the skin section. And uh, in the elderly, uh, we see clearly, so in false colors, the yellow here is where the lyso PCs would be while you have almost no lyso PC in skin of the uh, young individuals. So, well, now we have again a marker, but is there some function to it? Can we use that? Uh, to kill senescent cells. Uh, so we looked at the pathway, how these lyso PCs would be generated in a cell. So the hypothesis that we phrased is senescence leads to, uh, uh, to, to higher hydrolysis of these uh, precursor lipids, generating lyso, SPC, and PPC, together uh, with a second product, arachidonic acid. And actually from other settings, we know that arachidonic acid increase within cells can be toxic to the cells. Senescent cells do not die. So they must have a mechanism to get rid of too much arachidonic acid. And actually uh, it's those enzymes uh, that you all know very well because uh, they produce uh, the inflammatory acosanoids out of arachidonic acid. COX-1, COX-2, and they are inhibited by aspirin. So everybody takes aspirin. Uh, so uh, this is one of the enzymes that get rid, gets rid of arachidonic acid. There are a couple of others, ALOX-5, SIPS, and the arachidonic acid can also be re, uh, uh, reused uh, by a pathway uh, that can be inhibited by a, a drug called trioxin C. So aspirin and diclofenac and similar as well as trioxin C can inhibit the conversion of arachidonic acid. So the idea was that uh, if we inhibit this conversion now, arachidonic acid levels should go that high that the cell starts to die. And it should only hit senescent cells 
uh, because normal cells, they do not upregulate uh, this hydrolysis as much as the senescent cells. So are the phospholipases upregulated? Yes, they are on gene expression level. They are on uh, uh, enzymatic activity level and arachidonic acid is also elevated in senescent cells. So, so far our hypothesis must be true. Now, using aspirin or diclofenac or, uh, or other single inhibitors didn't do anything. So obviously the other enzymes are still efficient enough to get rid of the arachidonic acid. However, as soon as we block, oh, sorry, as soon as we block more than, uh, more than two pathways, suddenly the senescent cells start to die while the normal control cells do not. So we tested a couple of different senescent cell types, skin fibroblasts, uh, uh, we, we have a, a therapeutic window of 2.5-fold change in the sensitivity to the treatment. Uh, we have kidney epithelial cells, uh, which have a, a, a therapeutic window of 350-fold difference in the drug amount that we can use uh, until the healthy cells would start to die off. Uh, and in endothelial cells, we don't even get the toxicity to uh, non-senescent endothelial cells. So uh, only, the, only the senescent ones die off. Um, so we were pretty excited, obviously. Uh, but still now, is this really true to the uh, increase in formation of arachidonic acid? And actually, that was nice because we were able to uh, use um, activators of phospholipases that then increase the levels of arachidonic acid. And if we use these, uh, we make young cells as sensitive as senescent cells. And there are also blockers to phospholipase activity, reducing the arachidonic acid levels. And with this, we rescue the senescent cells from the, uh, from the death uh, because they just don't produce uh, uh, arachidonic acid at those levels. So uh, we are at the state now to go uh, to preclinical uh, in vitro models and are testing uh, if we can kill senescent cells out of uh, uh, mice actually as a, as a first uh, model. So summary number two, arachidonic acid conversion uh, is a novel senolytic target candidate. And uh, by blocking this, we uh, hopefully can get uh, rid of senescent cells in the uh, at the end in the human body and restore uh, and, and, and restore regeneration by allowing the systemic environment that is not intoxicated by the SASP anymore to uh, rejuvenate and allow the resi resident cells that are uh, still around to uh, activate themselves and restore defects and, uh, and, and, and uh, cure or at least uh, improve um, uh, conditions, so uh, age-associated conditions. And I think I have to skip all the rest of my slides due to time reasons. Uh, it would be a lot on the James Bond-like activity on, of extracellular vesicles. Uh, I'll tell you next time. And uh, go directly uh, to the acknowledgements of, uh, of my lab here at uh, Ludwig Boltzmann Institute. Uh, the, uh, the alumni that, uh, uh, that, that worked with me uh, at uh, my Boku time at the Department of Biotechnology. I would, I would like to uh, specifically uh, thank uh, Vera and Ingo for the uh, development of the Senolytics, uh, Marcus for the Enzyme 5 and uh, Epitranscriptomics, uh, Lucy for the skin, uh, skin equivalents, and Sylvia for, for, the, for the bone. Uh, study, studies and uh, Madhu uh, in my lab actually he is now uh, the expert on extracellular vesicles from uh, mesenchymal stem cells that should improve uh, also age associated conditions and the, and thanks to uh, all the people that are now uh, employed at the uh, spin-off companies uh, especially the microRNA um, um, diagnostic stuff which is mainly uh, run by a former postdoc of my lab Matthias Hackel. Uh, that's my Boku lab, and uh, that's the institute I'm in now. And many thanks for your attention and uh, looking very much forward to discussing.
Thank you so much, Yaris. Um, great, great talk and so many, of course, results. Um, may I start with a maybe a simple but maybe also a quite difficult question. I think we know now that a senescent cell is not a senescent cell. And so what is known of the secretion of exosomes of the senescent cells, if the senescent cells is either a repetitive senescent cell or a stress-induced senescent cell, or even the stress-induced senescent cells, there are so many different uh, uh, senescent cells. So tell us a little bit more how that relates to your story. Uh, that, yeah, absolutely. Fully right. Uh, and we, we see the differences also in the uh, sensitivity to our senolytic treatment. You have a wide range of uh, how, how quickly they get killed, depending on the tissue type the senescent cells come from. So kidney, lung, uh, actually even chondrocytes. Uh, we, we have a pretty good uh, activity against uh, senescent chondrocytes. Um, so yes, they, they are different. I am not sure if anyone would have really compared the, the, the extracellular vesicle secretome of uh, senescence induced by different means. And uh, actually, we also didn't do that anymore, uh, more or less due to time reasons. Uh, uh, generating replicatively senescent cells takes months in culture, uh, while, while stress-induced senescence most probably is the more closely related to senescence that comes up in vivo. Uh, we, we, we think that out-replication of cells in, in, in vivo is not the main cellular senescence that we would observe. Um, so we, we, we focused on, on stress-induced senescence. So I cannot tell you uh, how much different this would be. It's clear from other studies in terms of uh, other cytokines that there are vast uh, differences and there are some forms of uh, senescence that, for example, are not as pro-inflammatory as others. So very clearly known, but not uh, uh, not in, in, in the space of extracellular vesicles. Yeah. And, and so the cargo might be different in yes. the cells, how senescent and where the senescence is coming from, maybe also from which in which tissues they are coming from. Um, so how can you detect where the exosomes are coming from? Can you do that by looking at the envelope as we would do <laughs> by receiving mails? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, to some degree, this is possible. Uh, for example, um, there, there are surface markers for specific cell types, like CD31 for endothelial cells. Uh, and since the, the, the vesicles do carry some markers of the, uh, of the surface of the uh, secreting cells, um, you expect that uh, endothelial cell-derived vesicles are also positive for CD31. And by this, we estimate that um, the amount of endothelial cell-derived vesicles in the circulation is about 5%. Most of the vesicles in the, in the circulation uh, seems to derive from different immune cells, not, not very surprising, I think. Uh, but we also find vesicles from other tissues in, tissues in there. And in order to really, really be sure which cell type the vesicle would come from, we developed a technology we call the snorkel tech. Uh, so we genetically engineered a surface molecule of, uh, of uh, extra extracellular vesicles to carry an extra uh, uh, vesicular tag uh, that can be affinity purified. Uh, and uh, this construct, uh, we, uh, we are generating a, 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 a conditional transgenic mouse uh, in, uh, in uh, collaboration uh, with um, Sandeep Kosler's lab at Mayo. Uh, so the, the, the mice are born uh, and we can exchange the promoter. So we will be able to use a P16 promoter to, to, to pull out vesicles from senescent cells, but you can also obviously use any promoter for that is specific for a tissue, uh, like TI2 for endothelial cells, and then you are uh, bona fide sure that what you pull out must come uh, from that specific tissue. So yeah, we're working on that. 
That's great. Yes. Maybe let's jump a little bit to the clinical application. Um, that's, of course, what I really like. Um, so you really showed the nice um, results about the FRAX and the microRNA 203A, yep. Um, yep. which are associated with fractures. In clinical practice, there's always the issue of also osteoporosis in males compared to females. It seems to be very differently regulated. Um, Curiosity uh, question, does, did you include also males in your analysis or is, are these female uh, yes. cohorts and what's their difference? Um, we did include males uh, and actually also uh, idiopathic uh, uh, osteoporotic cases. Uh, and we always end up with the same microarnes that, that are dysregulated in the circulation of these patients. So nowadays, the difference between the scientific, uh, uh, the, the papers we need to write, and the development of a true CIVD uh, test. Um, so scientifically, by now, we have used this technology uh, in the context of uh, WIND-1 mutated patients in collaboration with Uti Mekitie. Uh, we have used it uh, in, a, in a second uh, mutation that is known to cause uh, early onset osteoporosis. Uh, as, as we said, male, female, idiopathic, uh, diabetic osteoporosis, actually. There is no marker uh, but extreme CT to identify the, the fracture risk in diabetic patients. And diabetic patients have a two to three uh, times higher fracture risk. We find markers for that that are predictive. Uh, so now that, that's the scientific part. Now, now getting this really to the patient, um, for getting the CIVD mark, you need to come up with an intended use case. Uh, so we had to decide uh, where to go. And uh, then obviously uh, the, 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 the clear and logical uh, uh, selection is postmenopausal uh, osteoporosis because uh, this is the, the, the biggest patient group at need. Uh, so that the test will come that will come out is for post for assessing postmenopausal fracture risk. Yeah, that that's that's but it, great. But, but so it does react in, in males. Actually, the first paper because we didn't even have uh, blood samples from uh, from from elderly uh, females. Uh, this first this first study was uh, uh, was done on male osteoporosis patients, and actually we had healthy elderly blood. If you remember. Uh, which was from your lab, Andrea, from, yes. uh, from the Netherlands. And we had this subpopulation of females where we thought that they might probably be the ones at risk of uh, suffering from osteoporotic fractures. Yes, great. Um, my final question um, before handing to the audience. Um, so do I understand correctly that aspirin, diclofenac, could be used as synolytic drug to lower, and then it's a lyso PPC. Look, I think it's a shortcut, <laughs> but maybe also the audience is thinking about it. Is this really true, what Professor Grillari is telling us? Well, as we've seen aspirin alone, uh, and any of these drugs alone was not able to, uh, to, to kill off uh, uh, the senescent cells. Uh, at least not significantly. Uh, actually, this uh, NK866, which never went to clinics, was probably the best uh, as a single drug here. Um, so mm, not really efficient. On the other hand, there, there are data in, in, in mouse models uh, showing that, uh, uh, that, uh, that mice fed an aspirin uh, diet, they have an increase of about the 5% in their lifespan which is unclear why this is coming up. Is it an anti-inflammatory effect or would there be a potential tiny contribution by a senolytic effect? We cannot tell. Uh, senolytic it gets when you block more than one pathway and that you do not do. Usually you don't uh, eat uh, three different types of, of COX, ALOX and axle 4 inhibitors. So we, 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 don't have out, uh, the, uh, we, we don't have this data out there if that would, would, would really help at the end. And then also it gets difficult to, uh, to develop something like you know, uh, uh, an approach where you combine a couple of different drugs. 
So we are now screening for single molecules that can that can do the trick. So that's yeah. that's currently ongoing. Yeah. It will, it, I, it will not be aspirin alone. No, no, right. So I just wanted to get that out. The audience is very interested also how to intervene in the aging process. So don't start aspirin and diclofenac. It can have lots of side effects too. Yes. Um, don't, so... for, don't, don't forget <laughs> about the, 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 the stomach bleeding. Uh, that, that is one of the risk factors of aspirin. So don't just go out now and, and eat aspirin. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait until we have developed a, uh, developed a drug. <laughs> and especially not in the combination. Uh, very no. nice. I think there's lots of uh, audience questions. So uh, today uh, we have with us our research assistant, um, Shivanisha uh, Riventiran. What uh, does the audience ask us or ask Professor Grillari? Thank you, Prof. Andrea, and thank you so much, Professor Grillari, for a very informative talk. So we have a couple of questions from our audience. And I'd like to start us off with a question from David. Um, is there a reason why the body is unable to naturally eliminate senescent cells during the aging process? Oh, yeah. Very, very good question. Exciting question. And not fully understood question. So um, senescence is not only bad. So uh, there is senescence also coming up during development early on. Uh, and there is an essence that has also beneficial effects, for example, during wound healing. In those cases, uh, senescent cells come up transiently. So they are formed and then they get cleared. Either they uh, themselves get cleared, they, they clear themselves, or they get eaten up by the immune system. Now, the, 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 the bad things start to happen when senescent cells are not cleared by the immune system. And... Uh, we think that they adopt similar strategies to suppress the immune system like cancer cells do. So they, ev they evade immune surveillance. And actually, there is even a, a, a very nice study from a lab in San Francisco uh, showing in the context of type 1 diabetes that senescent cells in the pancreas uh, attract the immune system, evade being eaten by the immune system, but the immune system then goes havoc and, uh, and, uh, and destroys the surrounding tissue. Uh, so it seems like senescent cells have something like a look, don't touch co concept. So come here, immune system, uh, there's inflammation, sterile inflammation without any pathogen. Uh, and by that, uh, the, the immune system, similar to, the, the, to, to, to COVID infection, our own system, our own immune system uh, does a lot of damage in, in that condition. And similarly, we, we, we think uh, not at that level, but at, the, but, uh, but at some level, this pro-inflammatory status of senescent cells starts to, uh, to, to impact on the, on the environment, on the tissue environment. Thank you. And so, I think... In, in detail, how, how they evade, I, I, I don't think it's, it's completely known. Okay, thank you so much. And also related to that, um, people are asking if there are natural ways of eliminating senescent cells rather than taking drugs or supplements. Well, we, uh, I, I, I didn't see any non-drug treatment uh, as a senolytic if I, so far yet. Um, so the answer is there might be, uh, if you, if you consider, actually we have one, one, uh, one extract of, of natural sources, uh, from Chanel that was pretty, pretty senolytic. Uh, they are currently actually, uh, they are developing it, uh, into a cream. That, that comes close to a natural product, meaning we don't, we don't have the single molecule that do, does the job in, in, in that extract, um, but it's from a natural source. But remember, uh, natural sources can be super toxic, fugu, the fugu toxin. It's natural, but <laughs> still <laughs> nothing you want to have in a drug. Yes. Um, so... Would there be any limitations or potential downsides of eliminating senescence or using senolytics? Well, yes, there, there definitely might be. Uh, the, uh, first, depending on uh, do we do we do some 
So the, the, uh, the, the, a paper showing that, uh, that during wound healing, uh, senescent cells arise uh, and accelerate the wound healing before they go away again, the senescent cells. Um, so without senescent cells, the wounds still close, but not as fast uh, as with senescent cells. So the question is, uh, are there, besides wound healing, other conditions where senescent cells that arise transiently, which you would need, uh, are there conditions that we would disturb uh, by, by senolytics? So focusing on the senolytic per se. And then obviously there's the second category of adverse effects uh, by the targets that we, that we are uh, hitting. Uh, so is uh, fisetin or navitoflux uh, or uh, quercetin and tesatinib, are they... What are they really doing at the end? And uh, for Navitoclax, we know it's a, it's a cancer drug, and it's, it has pretty tough uh, uh, side effects uh, on uh, uh, thrombocytopenia. So this is never going to make it, uh, in my view, uh, to a treatment of healthy individuals that uh, want to have something like a uh, uh, you know, preventive measure. So yeah, side effects, as with any kind of treatment, we need to cope with them. We need to uh, have a risk assessment. A risk assessment, is it worth uh, uh, the risk? And here with, uh, el with eliminating senescent cells, the, the, the risk for, for if, if you want to have it as a preventive measure to postpone the aging process, you would treat healthy individuals. So, so there, there is some risk, risk in that. Okay, thank you very much. And going back to mRNAs, so there's a question here asking if miRNAs are involved in regulating the increment of senescence-driven lyso-PC, and if so, are there any, sorry, is any loss in miRNAs that control the expression in phospholipases? A very good question. We didn't look at, uh, at microRNAs that control phospholipases, I have to say. So but very good idea. We have the data. We, we should go back to the database, yeah. And um, there is a question here asking how much of the research showing the improvement of age-associated diseases in mouse models using senolytics has actually been translatable to humans? Well, there is uh, actually clinical trials uh, uh, up and running in Mayo Clinic uh, with uh, their the satinib and quercetin combination. Uh, I, they, they did it in uh, idiopathic lung fibrosis as potentially as a, well, uh, it's a rare disease, as a potential model for then the, uh, the, the, the large indication COPD. Uh, and uh, there's, there's, a first, there's a first paper out uh, there by, by Jean Kirkland uh, showing that uh, with this treatment, uh, you should have, a, you should have a, a, a reduction, a slight reduction in senescence cells in the skin. Um, so yeah, it's, it is currently translated. And uh, besides Mayo Clinic, a lot of startup companies have, found, uh, ha have been founded uh, with uh, their own uh, drugs or with their specific indications they go after uh, to try to get that really to the patients. Eva, last question. Okay, last question. Um, is miRNA regulation predominantly targeted to the mesenchyme, or is this a more general regulation method? It's a it's a common uh, uh, regulation method uh, present in in any cell type in the human body. There are about a thousand, well, about what two to three thousand microRNAs that are known by now, uh, and uh, in different tissues, different sets of these. 3,000 microRNAs are expressed, and they help to maintain the, the cell type and tissue type uh, identity. Uh, so some microRNAs make sure that the muscle cell knows it's a muscle cell and it stays a muscle cell throughout life. Thank you so much, Shiva, first to um, really uh, look at the, the questions from the audience. And um, may I thank uh, Professor Grillari, Johannes, um, Thank you for joining us and sharing this great uh, knowledge uh, with us. 
I hope that your companies will have great success because we know that the healthcare really needs a little bit of a shakeup <laughs> to prevent age-related diseases. And I think you're on the right path. Um, I'm not sure if you can cure osteoporosis, but at least predict, as you said, fractures and can, um, can also renovate maybe the skin. Um, so that would be, be great. So thank you so much. Um, may I ask uh, you as um, listeners uh, from uh, at our Health Longevity webinar to use the chat function um, and choose, please, uh, the panelists and all the attendees to leave comments, feedback, questions, etc. And um, we will also present some news from our center and our school of medicine uh, after the end credits. Um, the next webinar will be April 21st in a week time. And Professor Brian Kennedy will host the show. And the next speaker is Professor Heinrich Jasper. I will leave you um, with a short video. Uh, and the video is about jellyfish and their secrets. Take care and thank you for listening. <laughs> Can jellyfish live forever? To understand this, let us observe the life cycle of a jellyfish. A fertilized egg of a jellyfish oh. forms planula. Planula then attaches itself to a hard surface like a rock or seafloor. Huh? Then it transforms into a polyp. Oh. Then through a process called budding, <laughs> tiny jellyfishes emerge from the polyp. Some jellyfishes oh. may live for a few hours, some may live for a few months, while some may live for several years. However, a type of jellyfish known as Turritopsis dorni which is also called the immortal jellyfish, is said to live forever. Oh, stop bluffing. How's that possible? When the immortal jellyfish is injured, stressed, or cannot find enough food, it reverses its life cycle. It transforms into a blob-like structure called uh -huh. cyst, which then transforms into a polyp. Then again, through budding, tiny jellyfishes emerge from the polyp, thus making Turritopsis dorini <laughs> immortal. Like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. I